Moon Over Manifest by Claire Vanderpool. Santa Fe Railway, Southeast Kansas, May 27, 1936. The movement of the train rocked me like a lullaby. I closed my eyes to the dusty countryside and imagined the sign I knew from the stories. The one just outside the town with big blue letters. Manifest. A town with a rich past and a bright future. I thought about my daddy, Gideon Tucker. He does his best talking in stories, but in recent weeks, those had become few and far between. So on the occasion when he'd say to me, Abilene, did I ever tell you about the time? I'd get all quiet and listen real hard. Mostly he'd tell stories about Manifest, the town where he'd lived once upon a time. His words drew pictures of brightly painted storefronts and bustling townsfolks. Hearing Gideon tell about it was like sucking on butterscotch, smooth and sweet. And when he'd go back to not saying much, I'd try recalling what it tasted like. Maybe that was how I found comfort just then, even with him being so far away, by remembering the flavor of his words. But mostly I could taste the sadness in his voice when he told me I couldn't stay with him for the summer while he worked a railroad job back in Alva. Something had changed in him. It started the day I got a cut on my knee. It got real bad, and I got real sick with infection. The doctor said I was lucky to come out of it. But it was like Gideon had gotten a wound in him, too, only he didn't come out of it. And it was painful enough to make him send me away. I reached into my satchel for the flower sack that held my few special things. A blue dress, two shiny dimes I'd earned collecting pop bottles, a letter from Gideon telling folks that I would be received by Pastor Harold at the Manifest Depot, and my most special something, kept in a box lined with an old 1917 Manifest Herald newspaper, my daddy's compass. In a gold case, it wore like a pocket watch, but just inside was a compass showing every direction. Only problem was, a working compass always points north. This one, the arrow dangled and jiggled just every which way. It wasn't even that old. It had the compass maker's name on it and the date it was made on the inside. St. Dizier, October 8, 1918. Gideon had always planned to get it fixed, but when I was leaving, he said he didn't need it anyway what with the train tracks to guide them. Still, I liked imagining that chain of broken compass was long enough to stretch all the way back into his pocket, with him at one end and me at the other. Smoothing out the yellow newspaper for the thousandth time, I scanned the page, hoping to find some bit of news about or insight into my daddy. But there was only the same old hogs and cattle report on one side and a Hattie Mays News Auxiliary chapter edition on the other, plus a couple of advertisements for Liberty Bonds and Billy Bump's hair tonic. I didn't know anything about Hattie Mae Harper, except that she wrote in her article, but that I figured that her newspaper column had protected Gideon's compass for some time, and for that I felt a sense of gratitude. I carefully placed the newspaper back in the box and stored the box in the satchel, but held on to the compass. I guess I just needed something to hold on to. The conductor came into the car. Manifest, next stop. The 745 evening train was going to be right on time. Conductors gave only a few minutes notice, so I had to hurry. I shoved the compass into a side pocket of the satchel and then made my way back to the last car. Being a paying customer this time with a full-fledged ticket, I didn't have to jump off and I knew that the preacher would be waiting for me. But as anyone worth his salt knows, it's best to get a look at a place before it gets a look at you. I'd worn my overalls just for the occasion. Besides, it would be dark. It wouldn't be dark for another hour, so I'd have time to find my way around. At the last car, I waited, listening the way I'd been taught. Wait till the clack of the train wheel slows to the rhythm of your heartbeat. The trouble is, my heart speeds up when I'm looking at the ground rushing by. Finally, I saw a grassy spot and jumped. The ground came quick and hard, but I landed and rolled as the train lumbered on without a thank you or goodbye. 
As I stood and brushed myself off, there was a sign not five feet in front of me. It was so weathered that there was hardly a chip of blue paint to be found, and it looked to have been all shot up. So bad most of the words were gone. All that was left read, Manifest, a town with a past. Hattie May's News Auxiliary, Chapter Edition, May 27, 1917. I am pleased this punch to be commencing this groundbreaking column in the Manifest Herald. My experience last year as assistant copy editor of the Manifest High School newspaper, Huzzah Huzzah for the Grizzlies, has provided me with an eye for the interesting and a nose for the newsy. I want to stop and explain here that this chapter is actually inserting some of the um, articles and the advertisements that were on printed on the newspaper that she's got her daddy's compass folded up into. So sometimes you are going back and forth in time because you will be with her as she tells the stories and then sometimes when she reads letters or when she's reading what's on the paper. So you have to make note of the date. Like I said, the date on the paper said May 27th. 1917. I'll continue on now. After Uncle Henry talked it over with his people at the paper, he decided to give me a column anyway. What with all our nation involved in the Great War and our young men leaving behind our sweet land of liberty, we must be vigilant on the home front. President Wilson has asked us all to do our patriotic duty in supporting the war effort, and already many are answering the call. Haley and Gillen says Liberty Bonds are selling quicker than half-inch nails at the hardware store. Miss Nora Larkin and the Daughters of the American Revolution are sewing victory quilts. Even Miss Velma T. Hartracker generously devoted our last week of our senior chemistry class to making relief parcels for our lads in arms. Despite a minor explosion while we mixed her elixir, the parcels turned out quite beautifully each wrapped in red and white and blue gingham, and I am sure they will be received with great appreciation. Now it is time for me to hang up my crown as Manifest Huckleberry Queen of 1917 and trade it for the hard scramble life of a journalist. And here is my pledge to you, faithful reader. You can count on me to be truthful and certifiable and given the honest to goodness scoop each and every week. So for all the what's for all the who's, what's, why's, when's, and where's, look at the backside of hogs and cattles every Sunday. Hattie Mae Harper, reporter about town. Next article says, Billy Bump's hair tonic. Listen up, fellas. Do you have a dry, itchy scalp? Wish you had more hair on your head? Is your hair turning the color of old gray goat? Then Billy Bump's hair tonic is for you. Just rub a little on your hair and scalp before bedtime, and when you wake up, you'll already notice a clean, tingly feeling. This means your hair is growing back, and in the same color you remember from your high school days. That's right, man. The ladies will notice the hair on your head in the spring in your step. Get your Billy Bumps hair tonic today at your local barber shop. Tell them Billy sent you and get a free comb. Works on mustaches and sideburns, too. But avoid contact with ears and noses. Buy a Liberty Bond and save American Liberty. <coughs> Next chapter is called Path to Perdition. May 27, 1936. So we're back to the present. First things first. After jumping from a train, you need to check and make sure you still had what you jumped with. That was always easy for me because I never had much. Gideon said all you needed was your traveling pack and a good head on your shoulders. I had both, so I figured I was in good shape. Heading for a grove of trees that looked half alive, I found a creek. It was only a trickle, but it felt cool and clean on my face and hands. Now I could face the preacher I was to stay with for the summer. How my daddy ever got hooked up with a preacher, I can't say, as he's not a church-going man. Apparently the preacher had taken in a wandering soul now again, and Gideon had been one of them. In any case, Pastor Harold was expecting me, and no amount of dilly-daddying would change that. I hunted up a good fence running stick and rattled it along the first fence I came to. 
Kitty and I found that that sound fills up an empty quiet. When I was younger, we spent many a, a walking hour singing, making up rhymes, and playing kick the can. Now the sound of a stick on a fence carried off into the trees, but it didn't fill the emptiness. And for the first time I could recall, I was alone. Maybe I'd try the rhyming. Gideon would start off with a line, and I'd come up with another that rhymed. The clatter of the stick provided a nice rhythm for the rhyme running in my head. I wish I had a penny, and I wish I had a nickel. I'd trade them both in for a coffee and a pickle. I wish I had a quarter, and I wish I had a dime. I'd buy a stick of gum before you could tell the time. I wish I had an apple, and I wish I had an orange. Hmm, I'd realized I'd rhymed myself into a corner with orange when my stick came to a gate. A gate, a wide, wrought iron gate that had every manner of doodads wielded right into it. Forks, kettles, horseshoes, and even the grate off an old potbelly stove. Looking closer, I ran my fingers over the black iron letters sitting along the top of the gate. The letters were kind of crooked and a little uneven, but they looked to read perdition. Now, Giddy and I had been to church enough services hoping to get a hot meal afterward that I had heard the word a time or ten. Preachers used it. They told people to give up their evil ways or follow the devil straight down the path to perdition. Why someone would want that word wielded on their gate, I can't say. But there it was. And weeds wrapped their way all up through the ironwork, daring you to enter. And there was an actual path. Beyond the gate, leaves and dandelions lined a long, grassless swatch of ground all the way up to a dilapidated old house. The path was worn off, and the porch swung crooked. The porch swing hung crooked, like it was plain out of a swing. Surely no one lived there. A train car or a shanty town by the railroad track seemed more seemed a more welcoming place. But one of the front curtains fluttered. Was someone watching? My heart beat like a wing's bat. I'm sorry, my heart beat like a bat's wings. For the time being, I was content to stay off that path to perdition. The town wasn't so far ahead, so I put my stick to the fence and continued walking. This time I did my rhyme in a quiet voice. I had a little cat and it had a little kitten. I'd put it in my lap wherever I'd be sitting. There was a break in the fence, but another started up again around the cemetery. Gravestone stood up in the wispy grass, seeming to watch me go by. The hair at the back of my neck prickled as the ground crunched behind me. I stopped and looked back. There was nothing but blowing leaves. I moved on, clattering my stick as the leaves grew thick around me. I had a little dog, and his name was Mike. I always let him sit wherever he liked. The branches clawed at me and stumbled on and I stumbled on a tree root. Tree, tree rot. <laughs> the branches clawed at me and I stumbled on a tree root, landing hard on my knee. It was the knee that had gotten cut a couple of months back, and it had scarred over, but the stretched skin felt like it was still working at keeping things together. I massaged it a little and brushed the dirt off. There it was again. Maybe not a sound, but a movement. I held my breath, listening to the quiet, then continued toward the lights as the, at the edge of the woods. I once had a horse, and his name was Fred. He ran all day, then another loud crunch behind me, and then a man's voice. He dropped dead? <laughs>